NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz Budnitz, and I am the Resource Council for the Cannabis Justice Initiative at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. I'm thrilled to invite you to our event entitled Bending the Art, a conversation with Keita Haynes and Juval Scott. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to hear from Sarah Gersten, who is the director of the Last Prisoner Project. Then we'll hear from John Albanis, who is the director of the Return to Freedom Project at the NACDL. And then I will introduce the speakers and we will um, we'll hear from Juval Scott and Keita Haynes. So um, I first want to open it up to Sarah Gersten of the Last Prisoner Project. She's going to say a few words about her project. Um, take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Liz. Welcome, everyone. As Liz mentioned, I'm the executive director for The Last Prisoner Project. We are a national nonprofit dedicated to cannabis justice reform. And our project was really founded because as the United States moves away from the criminalization of cannabis, as more and more states start to legalize, as we're building a legal and regulated market for cannabis, there remains the fundamental injustice that some are still incarcerated, are suffering the lasting collateral consequences of a conviction for the exact same activity. So to try to redress that fundamental injustice, we have teamed up with the NACDL through our Cannabis Justice Initiative, which works through direct legal intervention, as well as broad policy reform to try to repair these past harms. Um, and what we've found is that cannabis reform, of course, is criminal justice reform. And this work is so critical right now because cannabis, despite widespread legalization, is still a leading driver of arrest. It's still a leading driver of really lengthy sentences of incarceration, particularly for communities of color. And so we can use cannabis reform as a tool to redress some of the most pressing issues our nation is grappling with, from over-policing to mass incarceration. And luckily, what we're finding from this policy reform is that more and more states are actually implementing this type of retroactive relief in ballot initiatives, like we saw last night in Maryland, like we're seeing as more states use legislation to provide for things like resentencing, automatic expungement, and other forms of record clearance. And so cannabis reform really can be a tool not only to redress these issues within our cr criminal legal system, but also hopefully to lay the groundwork for these types of reforms for other types of offenses and be the guiding point for criminal justice reformers uh, to implement these types of reforms. So I'm really excited to be having this conversation today, super important and super timely. So thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you all to you for being here. And with that, I will turn it over to John, legal director of the Return to Freedom Project. Thanks so much, Sarah. And I'll just start off by saying that we are very happy to be partners with the Last Prisoner Project uh, in the Cannabis Justice Initiative, uh, which was founded with the lens for securing those injustices. Um, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers envisions a society where all individuals receive fair, rational, and humane treatment within the criminal legal system. Our mission is to serve as a leader alongside diverse coalitions, such as with LPP, in identifying and reforming flaws and inequities in the criminal legal system, and redressing systemic racism, and ensuring that our members and others in the criminal defense bar are fully equipped to serve all accused persons at the highest level. And one of our, um, Many goals of NACDL is to address uh, inequities in the criminal legal system, and that's part of the reason why we have the Return to Freedom Project, which is a post-conviction relief effort that recruits 
trains um, and supports volunteer attorneys who take on pro bono cases through our projects in an effort to get people out early from prison. And one of those efforts is the Cannabis Justice Initiative, which is the partnership with LBC. We've assigned several cases through that project, um, have had people released through that project, uh, and continue to support our volunteers as they work hard to get individuals impacted by marijuana convictions out of prison early. Um, so thank you to LPC for that, for their support in the CJI. Um, with that being said, I will turn it over to Liz now to introduce our distinguished speakers who I look forward to hearing from. Thanks, John. So, um, we're very excited to um, have these speakers join us. I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about them before we start. Um, these two speakers are working to combat the racial inequality inherent in marijuana laws, sentences, and policies. And we're happy to welcome them to speak about their work and their experiences. So Keita Haynes is Senior Legal Advisor at Free Hearts, a nonprofit organization led by women that have been formerly incarcerated. And she serves as the Federal Policy Analyst with the National Council for Incarcerated and Formerly Incarcerated Women and Girls. Prior to this, for six and a half years, she served her community as an assistant public defender in Nashville, Tennessee. There, she devoted all her determination, energy, and passion into fighting for her clients in the courtroom and in the community. In 2002, for her alleged involvement, involvement in a drug distribution ring, Keita was sentenced to seven years in federal pr prison for a crime she didn't commit. The United States Supreme Court remanded her case, and eventually she was resentenced to the mandatory minimum sentence of five years. Keita was finally released from federal prison on December 1st, 2006, after serving almost four years. Two years after her release, Keita enrolled into, in law school at the Nashville School of Law. She graduated in 2012 and became a practicing attorney. After clearing the character and fitness examination in Nashville, Tennessee, in addition to her work as a public defender, Keita served her community on the Juvenile Justice Realignment Task Force. She has received several awards and is very active in her community as the senior legal advisor with Free Hearts. She continues to educate and advocate on the behalf of the community, focusing on criminal justice reform, incarcerated women's rights, voter restoration, and various other issues. In 2020, Keita ran for Congress for the 5th District in Tennessee and received 40% of the vote against an entrenched incumbent. In addition, Ms. Haynes has written a memoir titled Bending the Arc, My Journey from Prison to Politics, and it's right here. Oh, I'm blurred out, but um, it's a wonderful book. I I read it and loved it. And I really hope that you pick it up. It's available on Amazon and at bookstores, and it's called Bending the Arc by Keita Haynes. Juval, Juval Scott has been in the Federal Public Defender for the Western District of Virginia since January 2019. Her district consists of three offices, Renoke, Charlottesville, and Abingdon, that handle federal criminal cases charged in the seven court locations that span the Western 63% of the state. Prior to her appointment as a federal public defender, she was an enthusiastic attorney advisor with the training division of the Defender Service Office in Washington, D.C. Before joining the training division, she was an assistant federal, federal defender in the Milwaukee office of the Federal Defender Services of Wisconsin and with the Indiana Federal Community Defenders in Indianapolis, Indiana. In her former life, Juvel worked as an associate in a small firm, primarily handling criminal, personal injury, and family law matters. She was a deputy prosecutor for the Tippecanoe County Prosecutor's Office in Lafayette, Indiana, and an associate general counsel for a private investigation firm focusing on trademark litigation. She has also served as judge pro tempore in the Marion County Criminal Courts. She received her law degree from Indiana University School of Law, and she obtained her Bachelor of Science in Biology with a minor in chemistry from Xavier. From Xavier. Um, so thank you so much for our speakers for taking the time with us. We really appreciate it. And I'm going to hand it over to Juval Scott and Keita Haynes to begin their discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
Um, whenever someone reads my bio and reminds me that I was a prosecutor, it makes me laugh on the inside. Right. I think that anyone who's ever met me knows that I'm not a prosecutor. Um, but it's so good to be here with you and to be able to have this conversation with Kita. I am excited to dive into some fun issues. And it comes at the perfect time, right? We just ended this uh, midterm election cycle. And Kita, you're uh, you know, a legal advisor for a nonprofit, but you're also the federal policy analyst. And I know we're still waiting for the final outcome of the election, but I mean, look, it's on everyone's minds. Uh, should we remain optimistic about the future of cannabis policy and reform given the election? <laughs> You know, as long as Chuck Grassley is there, no. <laughs> um, you know, he has horrible um, criminal justice reform bills. But, you know, there is bipartisan bipartisan support, um, you know, there um, around um, cannabis um, legislation. And because there's actually an oversight hearing next week that I will actually be testifying at, um, actually about the, the benefits of decriminalizing marijuana on the federal level. So um, people, are, you know, they're interested and they're talking about it in Congress. And um, hopefully, um, you know, they will be able to do something. And so the hearing next week, um, you know, what is that focusing on? And when is that in case people want to pay it some attention? <laughs> so it is next Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern, and it is with the House Oversight Civil Rights and Civil, Civil Liberties Committee. Um, and the purpose of that is to talk about the benefits of, of decriminalizing um, cannabis on the federal level. And so there will be several people that will be testifying. Um, you know, I will be talking about my particular situation because I do have a marijuana conviction. Um, it is aiding and abetting a conspiracy to distribute 100 to 400 kilograms of marijuana. So I'll be talking about my experience, um, the collateral consequences that most people um, experience with a marijuana conviction, with a federal conviction, and how it has impacted, um, you know, the black community. So that's what I'll be speaking about, but other people will be speaking about, um, you know, the dispensary business, um, you know, and just, a, just various different pieces of that. Now, just wait a second. You said that we we're going to talk about a whole lot of different things, but didn't just last month President Biden announced that uh, there's a pardon for all federal simple possession of marijuana offenses, and he urged all the governors and the states to do the same. Um, you know, have you been paying attention to the practical impact of that? You know, it was interesting. He did urge the governors and my governor here in the state of Tennessee, Bill Lee, who was um, reelected re last night with just the early vote. Um, the race was called for him 10 minutes after the polls closed. Um, <laughs> 10 minutes. Yeah, said absolutely not. Um, they would not be considering the president's um, directive. So, you know, there's there's that being in the red state in the south. But you know, with with what Biden um, announced, you know, what, about a month ago or so now, it's it's not really impacting a lot of people. I think you know we all know that no one is going to be released from prison based upon you know these pardons that he's given out. And so the question becomes: Is that how many people um, actually have simple possession federal marijuana charges? Um, I never met anybody in the four years that I was there in prison. And then the, you know, several years that I worked for an attorney who handled a tons of federal cases never came across anybody that had one. And, and, and then also too, I'm just thinking that some of the people that had them, like, is it just that, you know, or are there gun charges that's also there, you know, included with that. And so just what is, what does that really look like? But again, um, I don't qualify for that. And I know, um, you know, there are a lot of people that do have other marijuana um, offenses that will not qualify for that. So I'm hoping that Biden will um, uphold his promise when he was running for office that he would um, pardon people with marijuana offenses and that people would be getting out of jail. And so hopefully this was just the first thing that he did and that there is going to be more to come. And he did say that he was going to be doing some things. He wasn't going to wait until the end of his presidency that he would be doing um, some things kind of in the middle. So everybody is kind of watching that to see, you know, what's going to be the next thing that he's going to do. And it's worth noting that last night um, there were a couple of states that did legalize marijuana. We don't want to overlook those places that have made some progress. Um, I think it was Missouri and I can't in remember Maryland. Maryland, yeah. 
No, Maryland already had legalized, right? Oh, was it? I can't remember, but there were a couple of states that legalized it last night. But if you're in North Dakota, no fear, you're still not permitted to smoke marijuana. Um, mm-hmm. In Arkansas, you too have been less. Oh, it was Maryland. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay, so I used to live in Maryland. And now I, I must admit that I thought that it had been legalized in Maryland in like 2017. So I'm way off base. But if you live in um, the Dakotas or Arkansas, you still can't smoke weed, um, according to your election. I'm sorry you didn't win. And we kind of move from there. Now, what's interesting, though, with the legalization of marijuana is um, come dispensaries, right? And I mean, I don't know. I, it, it could be that I'm just way off base, but dispensaries are legalized distribution of drugs, which means that it's legalized drug dealing. Um, even Biden's pardon didn't allow those who had drug distri- marijuana distribution convictions to get any relief. And indeed, just today, I got a case in my office where I'm assigning uh, one of my attorneys a case that is marijuana distribution. Um, it just seems like that's a little bit of an odd, di- you know, an, an odd thing, right? You can sell weed, but only if you're some people and it's illegal in other instances. Uh, you know, what would a just outcome look like in this in this situation? You know, I'm, with what you described, I what I always say to that is that it is profits for them and prisons for us um, is essentially what that is, right? And most of the people that are owning these dispensaries are not people that that are looking like me, right? Um, And so that's really what it boils down to if we're being completely honest with this. This is is what it, it, it is. And so I think, you know, it's important that we call it what it is right um and talk about the racial disparities that um you know that this has had on black people and on our communities and uh you know when we're talking about what would be just and equitable well first of all like you know people that do have marijuana convictions that are still incarcerated should be released um from prison um, we should not have people that are serving um, prison sentences and some people that are serving life sentences behind marijuana convictions like that is just not something that should be happening and we should not continuing to be prosecuting people for any type of marijuana um, as well too and then those of us that do have marijuana convictions um everybody not just those with simple possession misdemeanor marijuana offenses need to be pardoned and you know our entire record needs to be cleared because as long as you have a conviction on your record you will never be able to get into the dispensary business anyways right and so if you know so i think we have to go all the way like wait so hold on hold on just pause there so you could um own a dispensary as long as you haven't dispensed prior Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Pretty much. Yeah. And so, you know, so we, you know, we can't just, you know, stop at, um, you know, pardoning people, we need to, we need to go all the way so that if, if myself or anyone else um, chooses to get into that business, then, you know, there should not be any hurdles for us to be able to get into, you know, what we have been prosecuted for that was illegal that now a lot of people are profiting from. Well, and that just kind of makes me think about, um, you know, the collateral consequences that are associated with having a marijuana conviction um, and what it means. We, You know, I jokingly said, wait, hold on, you can't have that prior, uh, like you can't dispense if you have that prior uh, distribution charge. But it, it's a it's it's interesting, right? Like the SBA, when they were giving out loans, small business loans, even during the pandemic, there was a lot of conversation about, um, you know, who could get the loans and what it looks like and what those line, loans could be used for. And so I know we were talking about that, but like with the SBA loans, you you said that um, sometimes if you have a prior, you're not even eligible for those, right? Yeah, that was that was a big thing during COVID, um, because, of course, if you had a business, 
um, any kind of business, like you could apply um, for a loan with the SBA and it wasn't a typical SBA loan. Um, you know, there was all types of forgiveness that was in that interest rates were lower than they normally are, just a bunch of things. And and again, and in, in prison, you know, they preach entrepreneurship. So you do have a lot of people that are directly impacted who do have their own businesses, whether it be, um, you know, a barbershop, whether it be cosmetology, whether it be, you know, plumbing, HVAC, you know, there are a lot of directly impacted people who do come out and start their own businesses. And so like everybody else it suffered, it suffered during the pandemic, but because of, you know, convictions on their record, we're not able Able to apply for an SBA loan and to get approved. And so that was a really, really big thing. And I'm not sure if the SBA changed their application process, but I know it was a really, really big thing when it came, you know, to that. And so, you know, here it is, you know, you're taught, you know, oh, well, if you're in prison, you should go out and you should start your own business if that's what you choose to do. But then when we are in, you know, this global pandemic, everybody else, you know, is able to take advantage of resources that's available to them from the government, except for those of us that are directly impacted. I mean, that's just one of the collateral consequences of, of having a conviction on your record. You know, I think we all know that there's a host of them. If I, if I could, before we jump into the others, one thing that struck me as interesting about the SBA loan um, scenario was that it appeared that if you had a prior drug conviction, you could be denied a loan because of like what they deem bad moral character or something of that nature, but that you could potentially get an SBA loan to run your dispensary. Yes, pretty much. Yes. Um, because again, that's you have a legitimate business and your business may have suffered during the pandemic. And so you could have applied with the SBA to get a loan. But, you know, if I let's just say that I had a cosmetology business, um, I you know, there is a, a huge likelihood that I would have been, um, you know, denied a loan from the SBA simply because of my background. And then and, and another thing that we were talking about when we were um, chatting before was about the impact of marijuana convictions on education loans. And I mean, you know, we, we talked about how so, you know, education loans are so important for people to be able to get to that next phase of life, some of, you know, so much of the time and um, a disproportionate number of uh, or disproportionate percentage of folks that rely upon loans to get through school happen to be, you know, black and brown folks. And so it's just another um, disparate impact, so to speak, on those communities. And you were talking about um, your own situation and kind of what it meant to process through the impact of your case on education loans. Could you share that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when uh, because when I came home, I started working on my master's before I went to law school and there was a question, um, you know, on the fast reform that asked about if you had been convicted um, of a drug offense and it, you know, it said like within a certain number of years. And so I, you know, was able to check um no because i was outside of that time frame but you know there are other people who may not be outside of that time frame and have to check yes and potentially would not be able to get again benefits from the federal government um simply because of a drug conviction on the record and it specifically asks for drug convictions is is what it says it doesn't say just like any just random conviction it specifically says drug convictions on there and you know, the, the the impact on like small, even just user quantities that um, could prohibit someone from being able to, to get access to a loan. It just, it really is an interesting, uh, it's an interesting form of punishment. Yeah, you um, know, we used to, and we would see this a lot um, when I was as working as a public defender, because we would have a lot of young college students who um, you know, would come through the public defender's office. And interestingly enough, the the one university here, um, if they had students who um, got caught with marijuana, they handled it on campus. And um, the other university, those students got arrested. Um, and so I'll let you all figure out, you know. And so let me see, you're in Nashville. If I were guessing, um, see, Nashville happens to be the home of, of historically Black college and university, as well as a a major um, elite university or what would be considered an elite university. 
would it be fair to say that the um, the on-site ones were processed at the elite university? <laughs> yes, uh, it would be safe to say that. And so, you know, we were always having to have these conversations um, with the DAs, uh, you know, before our local DA got to the point where they were not going to be, you know, prosecuting um you know marijuana offenses like that we would have to tell them like no like we cannot have our clients you know like plead guilty to this even if it is time served even if it is just a fine because there are so many things that this is going to impact their lives moving forward right and so you know we would have to educate the da's about the collateral consequences because of course they had no idea um and and really particularly when it came to you know our, our black kids who were arrested for um marijuana possession you know, when we were talking before, and I and I've told you this, um, we every time we talk, I learn about something different. As a criminal defense attorney, I consider myself to be fairly well versed in the collateral consequences. But I also know, just having gone to you know the collateral consequences website, there are thousands of them, so I can't know them all. Um, but when we were talking earlier, you mentioned something about life insurance that was just like wild to me. Yeah, um, I, you know, like you said, there's, there's a host of collateral consequences and, and even myself, sometimes like I'm still learning of what some of them are, you know, we know what the, the main ones are with um, jobs and housing and, you know, sometimes government benefits and stuff. But yeah, um, life insurance is one of them. They can deny you life insurance if you have a conviction on your record because they consider your lifestyle a little more, you know, I guess riskier than the average person who doesn't have um, a conviction on their record. And so, yeah, so I learned about that when I applied for um, life insurance and, and could not believe that I that I saw that on there and then started doing some research. And yeah, and that's that's what I saw that that is the reason why that is on that that question. And so you absolutely can be denied. One of the girls that I work with um, she was denied um, life insurance through one um, company, and she had to actually try it with two different companies before she was able to get to life insurance. And she, you know, had a very high, you know, premium that she was going to have to pay in order for them to insure her just based upon what her conviction was. And then, um, you know, it, it goes without saying that, you know, we... I, and in this, and when we were chatting, I said, you know, there are a lot of people who come out of um, custody, and they are, you know, they work in the the barber or the beauty industry because the state, you know, the states allow them to get the licensure in that respect. Um, and then you talked about, you know, just how different your process to get your law license was than my own. Yes. Right. Yes, it was. It was completely different. <laughs> Um, and that's the thing, again, you know, that's with that's one of the collateral consequences. And, you know, there are a lot of issues when it comes to licensures with collateral consequences. And so for me, in order to get my law license, I had to actually go before the board for the board to determine whether I had the character and fitness to actually be an attorney in the state of Tennessee. And so essentially what that consisted of was um, defending my case all over again in front of five to six people who literally held you know my future in my hands the same way that the judge had done you know years ago and you know and and we talked about how traumatizing that can be for people particularly those of us who have maintained our innocence um you know but still unfortunately have been found guilty and then have to you know defend yourself all over again and so there are people who our nurses and people who are lawyers prior to going to prison, they don't even bother with going through the process again because it, like I said, it is traumatizing and, and it can be a dehumanizing process. And I think that's one thing that often gets lost in some of the conversations when we talk about, you know, policies or laws or impact is you know, the very real impact on individuals, what it means to be a person walking through society, you know, with this conviction, in your case, a marijuana conviction, um, a conviction for uh, an offense that 
people can now legally engage in the same behavior if they get the licensure. I mean, I understand that they have to have the licensure. Um, you know, shifting gears a little bit, you know, we talked some about politics and its impact and some of the changes. Um, are there any legislative efforts out there that you see that look promising? <laughs> um, you know, I had a conversation with a, a, a guy the other day, and he's part of another organization that does a lot of policy work. And um, they seem to think that they will be able to pass the Equal Act in this lame duck session. Um, so we shall see. Um, I hope that is true just because the equal act it has the potential of impacting over eight thousand people right and and can you just explain a little bit with the equal act just in case folks aren't on um top of the the legislation yes. <laughs> so it deals with the um the crack cocaine and powder cocaine disparity that you know that has been going on you know what i'm saying you know, since forever. And so there's been incremental changes that has happened with this disparity because it used to be 100 to one. And I think, is it down to maybe like 20 to one now or something? It's still not one to one, right? Um, you know, which is ultimately the goal. But um, what happened was, is that when they um, originally reduced it, they did not make it retroactive. And so the Equal Act will make that retroactive. So let's say someone who um, may have gotten a 20 year sentence, right? And it was crack cocaine, but um, would not have been able to benefit from being resentenced under that new ratio. And so the Equal Act will actually change that and will allow people to actually be resentenced up under that. And so um, if it does happen to pass, um, you know, in this lame duck session, then, um, you know, that would be great for a lot of people, um, you know, to be able, you know, to come home, um, you know, and who have done extreme amounts of time, you know, what I'm saying in prison, right. And so I am really hopeful we, um, there's actually a directly impacted lobby day um, at the end of the month to actually try to get some other um, Republicans on as co sponsors for the bill, um, you know, and without going into a lot without the bill, it's, you know, it's was looped in, you know, what I'm saying with the NDAA now. And so it's going into a different committee. And so trying to work that. And so those of us that are directly impacted, and particularly those of us that have been directly impacted on the federal level will be um, up there on the 29th and the 30th of this month, um, trying to get some more um, Republican co-sponsors and and hopefully, you know, get some type of assurance that this is something that will move during this lame deck session. So I know that that is one of the things um, and that is probably uh, as far as criminal justice reform is concerned, that is probably the only thing um, that that is probably that that has any chance of of moving right now. And then we'll just have to see what the makeup is going to be. You know, the Democrats are probably going to be losing the House. Um, you know, the Senate is, is still up and may still be up until after December 6th. So, you know, that's going to kind of really depend on what we're going to be able to move and and how we're going to be able to move things um, in Congress over the next two years. So, um, you know, I, I think along with a lot of, you know, federal advocates like we did not go to bed until extremely late <laughs> last night watching, um, you know, uh, you know, all of the returns come in. And so we are definitely on pins and needles because it, it will impact what we're able to to do and not do and and then it will also impact some of the horrible um you know bills that are already moving through um you know like some of the horrible crime bills that they have up there as well too so um elections have consequences we've heard that many times and and they definitely do <laughs> yeah i almost made a joke that i'm gonna just hold for a second um <laughs> They do have consequences, believe it or not. Um, you know, that that one, of course, sounds promising. We all, I think, hope that the Equal Act goes through. It, it's, it's been past time. Um, I don't think it was ever proper that they righted the inequity of the crack cocaine, um, powder cocaine law piecemeal and over the course of now more than a decade. Um, 
or that it was ever passed uh, in, in the first place with such a disparity. Um, but, you know, is, are there any, is there any legislation as related to like marijuana um, that may be on the horizon that maybe we should look at that folks maybe can press for some advocacy or things along that line? So the the Moore Act um, actually got actually passed the House, and um, that's that's you know a bill that's really being pushed by um, um, DPA Drug Policy Alliance. That's their their bill, and they I know that they were going to be focusing on the Senate piece of that, but um, yeah. So it'll just be interesting to see what and tell us again what the Moore Act is. So the Moore Act, um, it had to do with marijuana and it had a lot of, um, you know, legislation. I mean, it had a lot of language in there about, um, you know, expungements for people with marijuana convictions and essentially, you know, like decriminalizing uh, marijuana on the federal level. So it it did pass, like I said, the House um, and they were going to be focusing on the Senate. And again, and so that's why I say, you know, we're all on pins and needles like watching this because you know, the Democrats have, you know, had a slight majority in the, you know, the Senate beforehand. And, you know, just depending on what happens, we may still have that or we may not have that. And so, again, that's going to impact how legislation is going to be introduced, how it's going to be moved, who are you going to seek out as co-sponsors, you know, or if this is something that, uh, you know, we're just going to have to do education about and then see what happens in 2024 and see if we have a better landscape to move some things. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, I think with Biden doing what he did, and kind of like taking a stand on marijuana convictions. Now, I don't think that Joe Biden will do any type of executive order decriminalizing marijuana at all. Um, I don't think he will go that far. But even with reducing, um, you know what I'm saying, the level, right? I think that goes a long way as well too. So we may see something like that, but I think the fact that he has, you know, at least taken some type of stance on marijuana, um, hopefully, um, Congress will be willing to follow suit. So we will, we will see. But um, yeah, I mean, like, there's always opportunities to, you know, to advocate around, you know, marijuana legislation, you know, that's what we're talking about now. But, you know, there's so many other um, bills that, um, you know, there's room for, for definitely um, any type of, you know, advocacy work. Um, one of the ones that I'm super passionate about is the, the DRA, the Democracy Restoration Act. And, that will deal with the collateral consequences of you losing your voting rights because of a federal conviction on your record. And so what the DRA says is that once you are done with your sentence, your voting rights are automatically restored, regardless of any type of legal debt that you may owe, regardless of anything else, right? Which is huge for us in Tennessee, where we disenfranchise over 450,000 people, um, number three in the entire country, and have the, one of the most restrictive um, rights restoration laws. We're the only state where you not only have to finish your sentence, pay off your legal debt, but you also have to be current on your child support. Um, the only state that has that. And so, yeah, so that would force states to actually have to get in line with federal legislation because it would be really hard to distinguish that, oh, well, you can vote in this federal election, but not this, you know, local state election when they're both on the same ballot at the same time. So, um, you know, we are definitely, definitely moving that and pushing that, um, you know, and like I said, so that's that's one of the things that that I am super passionate about when it comes to that. And, um, you know, and, and like I said, the Equal Act definitely want that um, to go through, would love to see the Senate do something with the Moore Act. And so, like I said, there's all types of ways. And then, you know, not just that, um, but also with the United States Sentencing Commission, you know, they have release their, you know, I'm saying list of priorities. And so that's an opportunity to be able to advocate about that as well, too. Um, and, and that's a, a specific set of, you know, legal knowledge that people in the federal system will only have, right. And so it's definitely an opportunity for, um, you know, public defenders, because this is something that is impacting your work that you do every single day and impacting your clients. It's definitely an opportunity for, you know, for you all to be the experts on, you know, what is, you know, a good amendment, what is a bad one, and and to really talk about what it is that you are seeing and experiencing on the front lines, having to, you know, deal with this. And so that that is a huge opportunity to, um, you know, to, for the federal defenders to be able to advocate when it comes to what the, the United States Sentencing Commission is going to be doing there. 
So like first with the um, with the voting uh, act, I mean, if I hear you correctly, the act itself would only impact those federal convictions. It's a federal act. The states would not be bound to it. But it is but the belief is that because it would be too difficult to enact a process um, that bifurcated the elections, particularly on the, on the years where you have these big elections, that the states would follow suit. So they wouldn't be mandated according to the act, but that they could um, impose that, right? Exactly, exactly, yes. And so um, just kind of shifting to the um, Sentencing Commission, we were talking, we've talked about this and, and the way that um, it's the federal public defenders that primarily deal with the Sentencing Commission and um, what it means to process through that type of advocacy to the commission. And, and we talked about the way that they could involve, you know, people who have been, actually been impacted by, by the laws in their advocacy. Um, and, 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 you know, frankly, you know, maybe why they don't. And so, um, you know, uh, how do you think they could involve formerly incarcerated individuals in their advocacy to the Sentencing Commission in hopes of getting, um, I don't know, like more equitable or better outcomes in the newest version of the guidelines? Yes. Yeah, so generally there's a, a period um i think it's like a period of maybe like 90 days where they have like open comments and where they have you know testimony and so that is a way for those of us that are directly impacted to be able to um actually testify in front of the commission about you know some of their amendments um you know we've had conversations about this and one of the ones that i am really really passionate about is being um is the acqu acquitted conduct piece um <laughs> you know i am i am extremely extremely passionate about that and really think that that is something that should be done and think that it's something that should be looked at it is an issue that came up in my case um, you know, where we had to fight about, you know, the whole acquitted conduct piece and stuff like that. Um, I and just, uh, sorry, just real quick, um, for those that don't practice in federal court or don't know, when you um, are convicted in federal court and you get to sentencing, even if you were convicted at trial of certain conduct, that can be factored in for your sentencing, at, for your sentence. And what it does is it drives your sentence up. So you might be convicted, the jury might find you guilty of a count that has one kilogram of drugs, but then in the trial, they introduced information about 200 kilograms of drugs. And when you go to sentencing, you can be sentenced for all 200, even though the jury didn't find you guilty. Sorry, I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, it's it's a whole mess. It's it is it's a whole mess there. Um, you know, and so that's that's one of the things, right? Um, and you know that that I really wish that they would take up. And then there's also the whole compassionate release piece. And then there is the whole thing with the, you know the guns and you know. So there's there's several different um, you know priorities. And I think that there was even something um that they were considering because i think there was a split about like acceptance of responsibility if you went to trial right you know like that is that is my situation you know again and you know and so it's just like you have these numbers and you read them but it's different when you see um someone and you hear them talk about it right um you know for instance like with my case it's just like it doesn't make any sense that a person cannot you know get um, a downward departure for acceptance of responsibility when simply because they choose to exercise a right that is given to us under, you know, the actual constitution, right, that we are punished for exercising a right that we, you know, that we are given. Um, and, and I think it's different when you hear from people that have experienced this, right, and, and then like, and what does that three points do? Um, for particularly in my case, I was already looking at a mandatory minimum just because of the amount of marijuana that was charged in the indictment and, you know, just a whole bunch of mess with that. So I was already looking at that. And but then um, they did, you know, they added on, you know, what I'm saying like some some extra points and stuff like that. So it took me from just being subjected to a mandatory minimum of five years to actually getting originally sentenced to 84 months, which is seven years, which was the middle of my guideline range, you know, at that time. Right. And so like and so I think, you know, like we see oh, well, it just adds like two points. Right. It only adds three points, you know, it, or it doesn't. And like and what does that mean, like in terms of sentencing and 
the impact that it has on people's lives. And so, um, you know, having directly impacted people to testify, having directly impacted people to um, submit, um, you know, written testimony, to submit comments, and even to have people that are incarcerated that have been impacted by these very things, to have them to actually submit comments as well during that comment period, I think would go a really, really long way when it comes to um, advocating in front of the United States Sentencing and Commission. And I think, um, you know, that's kind of the process and procedure. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. It wasn't my report, but that the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers did in the trial penalty report, incorporating the stories and, and you know, very real information from impacted individuals into the report to explain why um, there shouldn't be a trial penalty, why the trial penalty is unfair um, since it's attached to a constitutional right. Um, and, and the um, the continued over punishment when people exercise that right it deters people from actually pushing forward with their claims of innocence, and um, and so then we end up with a whole other uh, issue, which we've seen over the years, which is people who. Um, per, you know, that, that that haven't committed a crime, even in death penalty cases, you look at the Innocence Project, um, they're convicted and, and they're imprisoned and then ultimately, um, ultimately have those convictions set aside. So, um, you know, I, the voices of, of impacted individuals make for a more powerful report. And, you know, like I said, we, we saw that with the trial penalty report. Um, are there any communities that are moving in the right direction? Um, well, I guess it really depends, uh, you know, uh, Maryland and Missouri obviously are with, you know, passing, <laughs> you know, um, legalizing marijuana. Um, I think there were five states that had ballot initiatives to remove slavery from the Constitution. We were one of them and we actually um, won. And so slavery, slavery will be removed from our Constitution here in Tennessee. And so just imagine that here we are approaching 2023 and still talking about slavery being in the Constitution right um and there were you know i think i think all of the states except for louisiana like they actually voted to keep it in their constitution like imagine that but um you know so that is a step in the right direction and that was like the only bright light so that we had here in tennessee last night <laughs> Um, but, you know, so there are things that people are doing, um, you know, in in communities around things. And, and it's interestingly enough, because like having this slavery in the Constitution, like impacts people that that are incarcerated. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that people, you know, it's it's important that people understand that that, you know, when you look at that, you know, it's like the 13th Amendment, you know, what I'm saying like it did not abolish slavery. It just hit it. Right. Is, is what it did. Um, you know, and we've all read the books, seen the movies, you know, 13th and slavery as a new name and really talking about, you know, what I'm saying how it went, you know, what I'm saying from slavery to black codes, you know, to, you know, now mass incarceration. Right. And so just being able to do that and also to have that being led um, and pushed by people that were directly impacted and people that are serving prison sentences, um, you know, so to have that inside game and to see that work is just, you know, phenomenal, you know, across the country. Um, you know, and so those things are are great. Um, those things, you know, happened and, you know, we are moving in the direction that we should be moving in when it comes to that. But as far as criminal justice reform is concerned, you know, we will have to see because interestingly enough, a lot of states did pass truth and sentencing legislation. Um, you know, including Tennessee. And then, you know, we have this crime bill, um, you know, that Senator Grassley has that is moving, um, you know, on, on the federal level, right? And so it's just like we are taking several steps back when it comes to criminal justice reform, right? Um, you know, there's this whole tough on crime narrative, um, you know, violent crimes and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it's, it's like, did we not learn our lesson, you know, 20 years ago when we were locking people up, you know, just for the sake of it. And we saw that how that did not help. Um, but, you know, but we are still falling back on incarceration to deal with issues in, you know, our country instead of really digging into those issues and dealing with the problem. Right. And so, 
um, you know, hopefully we can get this this ship turned around, um, you know, with the work that we do in the communities and, you know, and with the help of, you know, all of you all, um, you know, being experts in this field, you know, as long as, you know, as well as so many of us. And hopefully, you know, we can kind of start to shift the narrative and to change the narrative and to say, you know what, like, instead of, you know, locking people up, how about we, you know, spend our money and, you know, and put resources into our community instead of, you know, giving a lot of money to the police and to sheriff's departments and those types of things. Because again, all of that is just leaving, leading to the over-policing of black and brown and low-income communities. And it is just fueling, you know, continuing to fuel, um, you know, mass incarceration. So we can't talk about like wanting to deal with mass incarceration when there are laws that are being passed that is going to continue to fuel mass incarceration. <laughs> Now, if I, if I could, you um, transitioned from working in a public defender space into policy space. And I know we were talking, I, I had mentioned that there are a lot of formerly incarcerated individuals that are working in policy space, and that's great. Um, and I talked about, you know, it's nice to see the presence and the voices, but um, I was stocked in some way to kind of hear that you know, the treatment of, of formerly incarcerated individuals in the policy space isn't always ideal. And so, you know, what are your thoughts about the way policy spaces treat impacted people? And what are some of the things we can do to um, maybe shift that? You know, it's it's policy spaces, and I'm seeing this now being in policy spaces as well, but it was also, even when I was a public defender, right? Um, you know, I talk about this in my book where, uh, you know, I had a situation where, uh, you know, had a judge question my credibility in front of my clients, in front of coworkers, in front of DAs, police officers, the entire courtroom of people. Um, and we, you know, got into a huge shouting match about it to the point where my client felt that he needed to apologize to me on behalf of the judge because he was just like, nobody should be treated that way, right? Um, you know, and and so it was that it was, um, you know, hearing other defense attorneys, um, you know, <laughs> loudly wondering why the public defender's office hired someone like me who had, you know, a background and did not go to some of the more prestigious law schools here, um, you know, in the state of Tennessee. And just, you know, carrying that burden of having to be three times as good as everybody else, you know, one, you know, because we know that the legal community is male dominated. So one having to be, you know, better than everybody else, you know, simply because I'm a woman, you know, two, because I'm black on top of that, and three, because I'm directly impacted. And like I said, you know, that was a hell of a burden, you know, to have to carry each and every single day on top of, you know, the burdens that I'm carrying for my clients dealing, you know, what I'm saying with this, you know, racist, you know, criminal legal system, right. Um, and then moving into the policy spaces, uh, you know, it's interesting, because you know, I have found, you know, we're just talking with several people that a lot of times it is our stories that are wanted. Um, and, you know, people don't understand that having us talk about, you know, what I'm saying our lives and our experiences is that we're having to relive trauma over and over and over again. And, you know, there are some people that will pay someone, let's say, who has several degrees behind their name to come in to talk about, um, you know, criminal justice reform and will pay them all kinds of money. But then we have directly impacted people. They want them to talk about, you know, their life for free and to relive that trauma for free. And, you know, we've got to start paying directly impacted people in the same way that we pay people who have all of these you know, degrees behind their names, because at the end of the day, it is directly impacted people who are the experts when it comes to this, right? Um, you know, and so that is one of the, you know, things that I've seen, you know, I've seen where um, there have been policies and procedures that have been put in place that have um, been, you know, that have impacted, directly impacted people. And so it's just, you know, making sure that, you know, that directly impacted people that we're, that we're not being used in these policy spaces, right? Because a lot of times that's what it feels like is that, you know, we're used for our stories, we're used for fundraising, um, you know, we're used so that, you know, you can get people to come, you know, to your event, like, you know, we're the highlight, we're, you know, what I'm saying the keynote speakers, but yet and still we are not treated as the expert. 
Um, and, you know, and, so, and that's, that's really big. And that is one of the things that we do talk about and do discuss, um, you know, in our communities is that, you know, those of us that have been impacted by this, we are the experts and, and like I said, and deserve to be treated as such. Now, I mean, you've mentioned a few times, uh, you know, some snippets about your story and, and I didn't have you tell the story. I, um, I guess I could have, it would have been interesting, but also you took the um, time to write a book. Um, I'll put it here for those to see it, Bending the Arc, My Journey from Prison to Politics. And, um, you know, folks can buy that as uh, Liz said earlier on Amazon or other bookstores. But I was curious, um, you know, what inspired you to tell your story? You know, it's it was so interesting because of course, my situation was was very different. Um, even when I got to prison, a lot of the women were like, why are you here? <laughs> like, this doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. How do you aid in a better conspiracy? Like, that's dumb, you know, I mean, and so, so, you know, and so it was, it was all of those. And even with, you know, talking with people and, you know, talking about the facts surrounding my situation, it was just like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, again, like, why are you here? And, and so, you know, the women used to always tell me that I definitely should write a story. And of course, you know, when I came home, people always told me that, um, you know, when I was able to go to law school and take the bar and, you know, and pass it, you know, people always said that, right? So people have told me that I should write a book for various different reasons. Um, I don't think, I don't think people's reasons, I, I think some of them may be the same as mine, some of them not, you know, I think it's, it's definitely to encourage other people. Number one, that our past doesn't define us, right? Um, and that even in spite of that, we can do and be whatever it is that we want to do and be. Um, and, you know, and, and I am someone who is definitely not let to my past define me, but um, also to, to bring light to the issues that's happening in the criminal legal system and, and to say, yes, like, this is who I am. Yes, I'm someone, you know, who was able to get my law degree um, after coming home, you know, with a conviction on my record. Yes, I'm someone, you know, who was able to run for Congress, but why are there not more, you know, people that are able to to do these great things like I am. And so, you know, and so to kind of like push back on that narrative, because sometimes it can be as if like people be like, oh, well, look at her, you know, like she made it, you know, like, so what's your excuse, right? And so to kind of push back on that, because I don't want people to think that that I've made it because there were obstacles and hurdles that I had to go through. And, you know, and, and along the way, I had, you know, certain levels of privilege that a lot of people don't have, including some of my clients. And just really talking about that and hoping that people will see that, okay, well, you know what, if maybe if we change these laws, maybe we would have more people like that. But also to, um, you know, it was just, like I said, just to pull back the curtain on what happens in the criminal legal system, just from like a firsthand perspective. And not only that, but, you know, like what happens in the criminal legal system from a personal perspective, but then also from being a lawyer and like, and what is that and what does that mean? And, and, you know, and just all of those things and just moving through that. And, and also too, um, you know, I think like, if you read the book, you see, um, you know, my growth and my evolution, um, you know, as an individual. And so hopefully, you know, will inspire other people to, to think differently as well too, right? Because even someone who is directly impacted, who had been through all of this, there were still things that I didn't know, um, you know, still things that I could have done better, right? And so just hopefully, even like, you know, when people seeing that people will be like, oh, well, you know what, like, I don't have half of the experience that she has. And if she feels as if like, she's still learning, and she's still growing, then maybe I need to be self reflective. And maybe because I can still grow and I can still learn, like, I don't know all the answers. If someone who is as close, you know, what I'm saying to this as she is didn't have the answers and was still able to grow and learn, then maybe, you know, we all should. So, you know, just a lot of, you know, different, you know, I think there are a lot of different themes, um, you know, throughout this. And I think there's there's a lot of different things that people that I hope that people um, take away, uh, you know, reading this just depending on on, you know, who who the person is and who's reading it, um, you know, like I said, and, and even, you know, it could just be 
a mom who has raised kids all her life and, you know, maybe has gotten divorced and is trying to figure out what her life is going to look like moving forward. Right. You know, like I went through that too. And so, you know, so it's not just really encouraging people who, you know, have a criminal record, but just encouraging anyone that regardless of what has happened in our lives that, you know, that we can move forward and we can define where we're going to go with that. We should make time for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Um, if anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat and we can um, ask the speakers those questions. And in the meantime, we had a few questions. CJI had a few questions um, for you. So we um, wanted to know what are the challenges that you face and what gives you hope? What are the challenges that I face? And what gives you hope? I, you know, I think I face a lot of challenges, right? Um, and I just think it just like every person just each and every single day, like there's a different challenge that I think that we have to overcome. Um, and so just, you know, being mindful is that, you know, this, this work that we do, it's not easy work. And so there is going to be a challenge in some shape, form or fashion. And, and just being able to be aware of that. And, you know, what, what gives me hope is, you know, I used to always say when I worked as a public defender and, you know, like it could be something that I thought was just like the worst thing. And and it's something that I talk about, too, is, um, you know, input versus outcome, because we can't control the outcome of what happens. Right. But we can control what we put in. Um, and, and even, you know, when I think about, you know, like my situation, um, you know, I will always say that, you know, my attorney was the best attorney ever, um, even though I still went to prison and spent four years in prison, just because of everything that he did, you know, we didn't control the outcome, right? Um, and even with my client, so I can think that, you know, that it was a horrible outcome, but, but to have a client to tell you, um, you know, that you did a good job and that they've never had anybody fight for them, you know, in the manner, you know, that you have done, like, you know, it's those types of things that, that give you hope. And then, you know, in the work now, you know, when we're able to get somebody's voting rights reinstated, who, you know, they've been work, trying to work through the process here in the state of Tennessee or didn't know that they could, right? And to be able to, you know, to get their rights restored and to be able to see them vote, you know, for the first time and talk to them about, you know, what that means and how they're so thankful, you know, for the work that we're doing. And then also not only that, but to see them want to come back into the movement to help other people, right? Like that, you know, that's, that's really impactful because not only did you have an impact on their lives so that they could get their voting rights back, but now they want to be a part of this because they have seen how it's impacted their lives and they want to have that same impact on other people's lives. So that's really good. And then, you know, with some other legislation that we're trying to move here in the state of Tennessee, when it comes to expungements, it's very narrow. So a lot of people don't qualify and you know, and you feel bad telling people that they don't and you say, but, you know, we're planning on introducing legislation around this. And they was just like, well, make sure you let me know because I want to be involved in that. And so just, you know, Oh, you know, building these relationships and not transactional relationships with people in the community, but building long lasting um, relationships in the community so that we can get this work done in the community for the community. I mean, the challenges are staying optimistic in the midst of uh, constant storms. I, I try very hard to believe that, you know, people act and act consistently with good intentions, but oftentimes the results of those intentions are, are negative. And so remaining positive is hard. But what gives me hope is that um, my children are... Um, bright eyed and they are resilient and they really push hard to um, to do the right thing and to be good people and to challenge people to be better than they are. And so I know that we are approaching a generation that is so very different mm -hmm. than what we currently see. And it, that gives me hope because um, oftentimes I look at these folks in my generation, and I think we're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, um, if we don't have any other questions, I think we've gone um, for quite a long time. Does anyone else have questions? Um, someone from CJI, the Cannabis Justice Initiative, or um, from Last Prisoner Project, does anyone else have any questions they'd like to ask? Well, um, I'm just, that was absolutely wonderful. And I'm just so thrilled that 
you both were able to join us. You hit on so many important issues that we deal with in our work, that all of us deal with in our work. And um, if you'd like to buy Kita's book, I just can't recommend it enough. I bought it for family members. It's so beautiful. Um, and you can also find out more about our work at www.nacdl.org or the Last Prisoners Project, Last Prisoner Project, which is www.lastprisonerproject.org. Finally, if you'd like to volunteer with us, um, this Cannabis Justice Initiative, we are taking volunteers who will file compassionate release motions or clemency petitions on behalf of folks who are um, impacted by cannabis convictions. So if you'd like to volunteer, we, we always take volunteers to file these motions and these petitions. Um, so you can contact us at um, www.nacdl.org slash cannabis, C-A-N-N-A-B-I-S. So um, thank you so much to everyone for coming and for speaking. It was just really inspirational and, and wonderful. Um, and we hope that we'll, you know, keep us, keep us posted on everything that you're doing. <laughs> yes. All the wonderful things you're doing. And if we can ever thank be of you. service to you, of course, we will be. Thank you so much. I thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It was wonderful. You're absolutely terrific. And Lisa R. E. D. just dropped in to say thank you as well. And I echo her thoughts. This was very uh, insightful and um, therapeutic. And I'm so glad we had you on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. it.